الحمد لله رب العالمين والعاقبة للمتقين ولا عدوان إلا على الظالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأولين والآخرين ورحمة الله للعالمين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ودي brothers and sisters طبتم وطاب ممشاكم وتبواتم من الجنة منزلة may Allah bless you may Allah bless your efforts and may Allah combine us together in Jannah al-Firdaus together with our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Uh, my dear brothers, today, inshallah, I would like to just shed some light on a part of the story of Prophet Yusuf alayhi salam. And this part, obviously, I would say almost everybody here knows the story of Prophet Yusuf and what happened to him, how his brothers plotted against him, how he was uh, uh, taken in the home of the uh, like prime minister in Egypt and then he was accused of uh, sexual harassment falsely, obviously, and he was put into prison. And then he entered into the prison. And this is the part we're going to focus on from the surah, inshallah. So, you know, subhanAllah, this is a prophet. Um, he's the rule model, actually, of chastity and uh, the, uh, the upright behavior. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took him as a child from one test to another, You know, imagine if your own brothers take you and want to get rid of you, kill of you, put you in the bottom of a well, and then you are taken as a slave. So he went all through all of this. And eventually, when he grew up, despite his ideal conduct, he was, and this is always famous in Egypt, they say the Egyptian is the only uh, people who accuse the prophet of sexual harassment. So, and um, they put him in prison. Actually, it's happening every day, but not with prophets anyhow. Uh, so the point is, he entered into the prison, and when you enter into a prison, and you are innocent, you didn't commit any guilt, you have some sort of bitterness in your heart. And actually, many people go to depression, many people just seclude from others, or have some violent attitude, just when trying to express their anger, or their frustration. But Prophet Yusuf was in this. Prophet Yusuf السلام, entered the prison and his mind and his heart was attached to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I'm starting with the ayahs which explains the moment of his entrance the prison and who entered with him. So, Allah says, and two young people have entered the prison with him. So at the same time he was admitted to the prison, two young people have entered the prison with him. And usually, by and large, the people in prison, these are criminals, people who have committed some, not everyone obviously, but by and large, these people who have committed some sort of crimes. So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned the story of Yusuf alayhi salam with these two young people. وَدَخَلَ مَعَهُ السِّجِنَ فَتَيَانِ قَالَ أَحَدُهُمْ Allah, the story quickly jumps to when they approached Prophet Yusuf One of them said, I saw myself in a dream pressing wine. And the other said, I see in a dream that I'm carrying bread on top of my head and birds would come and eat from that bread on top of my head. Would you please tell us about the interpretation of this dream? Um, they give the justification. Why among all the people in the prison they approach it, Prophet Yusuf? And this is a point we learn now. So, they said, Inna naraka min al We see that you are a good man. You are a man of a noble character. So, what made them choose Prophet Yusuf, even though they didn't know him before? What made them approach Prophet Yusuf alayhi salam and kind of express their worries and concern to him and ask him to give them the interpretation because of his noble character and attitude. Prophet Yusuf perhaps didn't talk to them before, didn't interact with them. They saw his conduct in the prison. He's not doing these bad things. He's with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's helping those who need help. He is a noble man in short terms. So what actually attracts most of us here are working and we interact in some one way or another with non-Muslims. Yes? And actually when you do something bad like you, are, you lie, you're dishonest, you steal something, you, you whatever evil things we, a person might do, 
And people ask, look, this is Muslims. This is what Islam teaches. This is not Muslim. This is not what Islam teaches. This is a, an individual behavior. But people who are not Muslims, they will they basically interpret your behavior as the teachings of your religion, particularly with the stereotypes that are dominant in the media about Islam and Muslims now. So these were non-Muslims, and they approached the Prophet Yusuf. And the reason why they approached him and nobody else is because of his attitude. So the first lesson we learn from this is your attitude will tell people about who you are and what your religion is. And in this you are an ambassador, ambassador of Islam. So you can be a bad ambassador, you can be a good ambassador. You can be approached for solutions and good suggestions, or you can be looked at with a dirty look, and you can be portrayed as an evil person who represents an evil religion. So this is the first thing. Again, a man in prison, he was not worried about his own problems, his own difficulties. He was worried about his relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through his relationship with the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whether these were Muslims or non-Muslims. That's why many of the scholars say, ad dinul mu'amala. The deen is all about how you behave. It's when you come and pray in the masjid, when you fast, alhamdulillah, that's good, you have to do it, but that's for your own benefit. Your colleague at work will not ask you, will not be harmed, or receive benefit from how many times you pray at night. What he want to see is how honest you, how helpful you are, you are, how cheerful you are when you talk to him. These are the behaviors. So, ad dinul mu'amala, religion is all about how you behave and how you transact with others. Tell, about, tell us about its interpretation. Indeed, we see you as a good man. Then, Prophet Yusuf السلام, have seized the opportunity. And this comes the second point. You need to be intelligent. Intelligent, not in an abusive way or a way that makes use or bad use of others, but in a way that you seize the opportunity that is available to you to serve your religion and to serve Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because many people think da'wah is imam. Imam has to make da'wah and that's no. Da'wah is an obligation on the Muslim ummah as a whole. It's called fardu kifaya. Fardu kifaya, which means a good portion of the ummah must make da'wah so that the da'wah reaches everybody that can possibly be reached. And if the bulk of the ummah does not do this da'wah, the whole of the ummah will be sinful. So if you have, for example, the ummah is almost 2 million people, 2 billion people now. If we go, for example, only 100,000 making da'wah, and that's not enough, da'wah is not spreading, the 2 billion will be sinful. So we have to do our part. You have to preach your religion. The first step, and I repeat, is your behavior. Actions speak louder than words. And this is very, very important to our youngest as well sitting here. Because you go to school, yes? And in the school you have so many Muslim and non-Muslim friends. And the way you behave, the way you act, is the way they will interpret your religion, your culture, everything about you. So, Prophet Yusuf was a very intelligent man, so he seized the opportunity to present the deen to them. But in a way that will not help them, and in a way that will not portray the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as something bad. So, قَالَ لَا يَأْتِكُمَا طَعَامٌ تُرْزَخَ Now they came you. You have a colleague who came you to help him with something. He needs, so he didn't come to you to ask about Islam or the deen or anything. He wants you to fulfill one of his needs. This came to Prophet Yusuf, not asking, not Allah, not asking, say, say, you look like a good man, you should know the interpretation. They have a whole little need. He gave them what they wanted. He helped them. But before that, he see the opportunity to present the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to him. And this is in Islam actually is a must. Why? Because it's deen over dunya. It's okay if you help your Muslim brother and it's actually, or even non-Muslim brother with a worldly need that he comes. is some of the good conduct that we should have, help people whether Muslims or non-Muslims. But for us Muslims, the deen is more important. So if you have the chance to present the deen, for someone who came you for a worldly need, then do this like Prophet Yusuf did. So, He now is showing them his CV, what his abilities. And in this he is not boasting, 
He is not showing off. لا يأتيكم طعام ترزقانه No food that is provided for you. Turzakani, he put it in the passive. So he provided you is by Allah, but he kept this for a later. That no food that has been come to you has been given to you unless I'm able to tell you about its interpretation. لا يأتيكم طعام ترزقانه إلا نبأتكم بتأويله قبل أن يأتيكم. So listen, I'm not just, I'm not only able to give you the interpretation of the dream, which I will do soon, but also I can tell you what food you will eat in the future, before it comes to you. So obviously that is something kind of miraculous. He doesn't know the unseen, but this is a skill that Allah has given to him. It's a miracle for a prophet. So now they become more amazed in his abilities, and they are more keen to learn or listen to him. And this is the skill of conversation, skill of communication. You should keep the person in front of you attached. Because if you're boring, they will not listen to you. So he gave them something, another something, another thing which is amazing. Where whatever food you comes to you, I'll be able to, today you're going to eat meat, tomorrow you're going to eat lint. That. قَبْلَ أَنْ يأتيكم. And then he came to the point. Why is mentioning this to them? Not to tell them I'm clever or I'm a good man. No. ذَلِكُمَ مِمَّا عَلَّمَنِي رَبِّ This is what my Lord had taught me. So now he brought Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala into the conversation by giving them something that will normally attract human curiosity. Okay, how did you know these interpretations of the dreams? How can you tell us about future food which you have not seen? Because my Lord has taught me that. This is how he brought Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala into the conversation. How he brought the deen into the communication with these two guys. So he brought Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Obviously the question that is popped into them, who is this Lord who taught you these things? And then he moved to another theme to indirectly criticize their false religions without hurting them. إِنِّي تَرَكْتُ مِلَّةَ قَوْمٍ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ بِاللَّهِ وَهُمْ بِالْآخِرَةِ كَافِرُونَ I, he didn't say them, you, like when he said, you bloody kafir, you bloody... Uh, listen, he's not going to listen. You completely shut him down. So you, you have to be sensible in what you say. If you attack someone, definitely, whether he's a Muslim or a non-Muslim, he's not going to listen to you. So you have to open the heart before, like the container. If you pour any liquid into a container which is closed, will it enter the container? You have to open it. Open the lid. And the lid of a human is his heart. You have to open the heart and then you can pour whatever you want to pour. If it's closed, if you shut him down, then he's not going to listen to you. So, now, sometimes you have to criticize because to tell him that something is good, what you're doing is bad, then you have to bring the good and the bad. There's no way you can speak about your good only unless you prove the other person's way is wrong. So, your way is wrong, this way is right. But the way you present this is very, very essential. That's why Muhammad Sallam was told, Udu ila sabili rabbika bil hikmati wal mawa'idati al-hasana. Make da'wa for your Lord with wisdom. Wisdom is very important. And gentle preaching. You have to be gentle. You have to be easy. You have to be approachable. You have to be someone who people would like to listen to you. وَجَادِلْهُمْ بِالَّتِي هِيَ أَحْسَنَ And when you have to argue with someone, then argue with the way that is the best. So, the Prophet ﷺ says in another hadith, مَا وُضِعَ الرِّفْقُ فِي شَيْءٍ إِلَّا زَانَ Gentleness. Whenever it's put in anything, it will be beautified. وَمَا نُزِعَ مِنْ شَيْءٍ إِلَّا شَانَ And whatever is removed, whenever gentleness and easiness is removed from something, it will tarnish it. So we have to be gentle in our da'wah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So now he introduced Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to them in an indirect way. And now he is going to criticize the religion. But he will not tell them, listen guys, you follow a false religion. They will not listen. Inni taraktu. He spoke as if he spoke speaking about himself. I have left behind me the religion. Taraktu millataqa. Oh people, not you guys, I'm talking about other people. La yu'minuna billah. Those people who do not believe in Allah. So now he criticized their religion without pointing the fingers at them. And he said to them, who is his Lord? Allah. I have left behind me, I have quitted 
the religion of those who do not believe in Allah. وَهُمْ بِالْآخِرَةِ هُمْ كَافِرُونَ And they are in the akhirah disbelievers. Meaning they don't believe in the akhirah. So it used the main tenets of the deen. Believe in Allah and believe in the day of judgment. For them they don't believe in this. Because they are not Muslims. But again, he said, I left it behind me. He didn't say, now guys you do this and this is wrong. Because he would have completely shut them down. What tabatu? Okay, if you leave these four things, which one to follow? You have to you have refuted something that is not gonna work, that is wrong. Okay, what is right then? This is why he presented them well. What tabatu millata qawmi? And I have followed the deen, the religion of people. What tabatu millata abai? The religion of my fathers. He now presented to them the kind of the three of prophets which are affiliated to him. He's telling them who he is now. In a way that also presenting the religion to them. I followed the way of my fathers and sisters, basically. And this he counted Prophet Ibrahim, Prophet Ismail, and Prophet Ishaq. وتبعت ملة آبائي إبراهيم وإسحاق ويعقوب ما كان لا إسحاق ويعقوب أزول ما كان لنا أن نشرك What is this religion that you're talking about? We will never associate partners with Allah. So this is basically the core of any Islamic religion. From Adam until Muhammad Sallam, believe in Allah, no deity besides him. So he presented the deen to them in an engaging way without directing criticism Directly at them. And I followed. So, my Lord has taught me this. You interested in this? This is taught to me by my Lord. My Lord is the one deity who has no partner with him. And this is, I have inherited from my parents, my forefathers, Ibrahim, Ishaq, and Yaqub. We worship him as one true Lord. And we dedicate all of our lives to him. That's basically the best summary of Islam you can ever think of. He presented it in a very succinct way and a very engaging way to them. And then he started giving them after this is what we call the textual proof. This is the message. After you present the message, you say to him, the Quran says, the hadith says, okay, he doesn't believe in the Quran, he doesn't believe in the hadith, so if you tell him a verse from the Quran or a verse from the hadith, he might not believe, he doesn't believe it in the first place. So you have to present to him the other side of the argument which he, he believes in, and now that is the logic. This is the second part where Prophet Yusuf السلام, spoke to the companions of prison about using logic to introduce Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, inshallah we'll speak about this in the second part of the khutbah, Udu Allah. Alhamdulillahi wahdah, wa salatu wa salamu ala man la nabiya ba'dah, thumma amma ba'd. Inshallah we'll try to finish quickly because the brother's waiting and then we will inshallah find another occasion to complete the, uh, the, this part of the story of Prophet Yusuf alayhi salam. Ya sahibai sijjah. When he was addressing them, he doesn't know them and they don't know him. They just saw each other in the prison. So, and he's making da'wah to them. So basically, when you're making da'wah, you have to find something. You always, everybody must have something in common with someone else. So, we are, when I say a brother, when I speak to you, I say brother. You're not my blood brother, but you're my brother in Islam. You can say a brother to a non-Muslim, he's brother in humanity, whether he believes in Allah or not. So there is something now in common. What is in common between Yusuf السلام, and these guys now is that they are fr companions of the same prison. So he used this to find, to tell them guys, like we are in one boat now. He didn't tell them, listen guys, or call them by name, yeah, sahib, say, oh my companions in the prison. So when companions tells you that you and me are like friends, you are mates, we kind of share similar things. And this is a way of engaging the listeners. You talk to them, Prophet Ibrahim السلام, will always make dua for his children. And also, prophets, when they speak to the people, they say, Ya qawmi, oh my own people. Okay, Ya bunayya, oh my dear beloved child. 
Prophet Yaqub, when he was talking to his Yusuf alayhi salam about the he said, Ya Bunayya la taks, oh my dear little son. So there is a link between the father and the son. And when Prophet Ibrahim was speaking to his father, who was a non-Muslim, giving da'wah to him, Ya Abati, oh my dear beloved father. So the language we use make a lot of difference. Because again, you have to open the heart, and the way to open the heart is the way your actions, your reactions, and your language is being used. Oh my companions, my two companions of the prayer. Ask you this question, because probably they were slaves. And slavery, we know the human slavery is no longer in existence, and we got slavery to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So both are mentioned in the Quran. So they know if you are a slave, not saying do this, but if someone is wound, Allah mentioned this example in the Quran actually. You are a slave or a servant to someone, and you have one master. I tell you, you do this, you do it, leave this, you leave it. So you have one commandment, yes? So if he tells you to do something, you listen, you do it, don't do this, you don't do it, finish. But if you have several disputing partners who own you, someone is telling you, ah, go to Tesco, now no, no, go to Sainsbury's. Okay, that's, no, 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 go to Lidl. Okay, which one are you going to listen to? If you listen to one of them, you're going to disobey the others, yes? So this is the, the, the logical example. Allah gives it in the Quran. Darab Allahu mathalan rajulan fihi shuraka'u mutashakisuna wa rajulan salama li rajul. Hal istawani mathalan, Allah gives the example of a man owned by several disputed partners and another owned by one person only. Are they equal? Obviously not. Because the one who is owned by one person, he's got one command, one direction, follow. Simple. The other one, what to do? You got so many contradicting commandments. So, what's better? You give the answer. Now is a question. Obviously, Prophet Yusuf know the answer, but he wants them to give the answer. What is better? You have several disputing partners, or you have several disputing masters, or you have one, which is Allah. So he took it the imagery from the human slavery to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in one sentence. All my companions of prison, which is better? Several disputing lords or Allah, the only, the omnipotent. And the answer is no. And after that, he went, he escalated the argument and he spoke about what they worship. Inshallah, we'll leave this for next time. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you all, inshallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala combine us together in Jannah al Firdaus, inshallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you and your families. Allahumma ufil lana dhunubana. وإسرافنا في أمرنا وثبت على الحق أقدامنا وانصرنا على أعدائنا اللهم اجعلنا ممن دعاك فأجبته واستهداك فهديته واستنصرك فنصرته وتاب إليك فقبلته اللهم طهر قلوبنا من النفاق وأعمالنا من الرياء وألسنتنا من الكذب وأعيننا من الخيانة إنك تعلم قائنة الأعين وما تخفي الصدور اللهم اهدنا واهدي بنا واجعلنا سببا لمن اهتدى وصلى الله وسلم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أقم الصلاة